This is Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. From the corporate office to the cab of a truck, they're here to inspire and empower women in all professions. So gear down, sit back, and enjoy. Welcome to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy DeCaro. We're a show that works to inspire and empower women in trucking, in the trades, and every profession. We tackle all kinds of topics, and we work to encourage women to be their very best with informative guests and women who've been champions. I'm Shelley. And I'm Kathy. No topic is taboo on our rig. We tackle the tough topics along with the not-so-tough topics. And we like to feature experts and celebrities who can assist women in being the very best they can be. Getting ahead in your career while still balancing your personal and family life is difficult for many women. Too often, they're dissatisfied with a job they may have or don't find that their needs are being met in the workplace. Bunny Young is the founder of Better Place Consulting and a former stunt woman turned serial entrepreneur. Bunny realized that there was a need to help professionals make the most of their business and personal life. She makes it her business to defy negative trends and turn organizations into empowered cultures. She helps people open their minds to possibilities and uncover their potential. She assists with burnout, motivation, compassion, fatigue, and many other issues. Bunny is a powerhouse of inspiration with a unique story of her own of breaking barriers that we wanted to feature. She's a wife and mother, as well as a career woman, so she knows how to do a balancing act. We have Bunny on the show with us to talk about her stellar background and share her insight. Welcome, Bunny. Thanks. So glad to be here. This is so exciting. Um, Of course, I'm curious. (laughs) What inspired you to become a stunt woman? What did you do? I mean, that's so very cool. Uh, You definitely entered a man's world. (laughs) <laughs> Quite literally. Yeah. So my now husband is a stunt man and he got a unique opportunity to go to China and do a stunt show, a live action stunt show in China. And he came to me with a proposal that said, you know, do you want to go with me to China? And um, I'm going to do stunts, except we have to be married if you want to go with me. And and to this day, I honestly don't know if that was legit or if he just made that up to get me to marry him. <laughs> that's, that's a unique way of doing it. <laughs> but it worked. And I, you know, I had a couple jobs and a company at that point in my life. And I just couldn't imagine going over there and just kind of doing nothing. And so I convinced the company to give me a job as well. I had a background in modeling at that point. And so it wasn't it lost on me that it was some kind of show business, you know, entertainment type thing. I had a very steep learning curve though. I was one of only three women on the entire set and um, it was a blast. It really was. It was one of those things that it was like, you're never going to get this opportunity again, most likely. And so why not just say yes? And because we didn't have a whole lot of women on set. I ended up working like six days a week. My husband got to enjoy China a little bit more than I did because I was working a lot, but it was, uh, it was just a huge, incredible opportunity. And I'm so glad I did it. And I learned so much. Oh, this is so cool. Now, how do you go from modeling to becoming a stunt woman? What's the training involved? I mean, the, the, that's a total juxtaposition, a total different type of career. Yeah, they trained me. Uh, I had grown up being pretty athletic. And so I had a lot of the like natural athleticism. My Uh stunts were fighting and a 40 foot face first Australian rappel an Aussie rappel. And so I'd done rock climbing and rappelling before. And so it was like, I was familiar with all of the fundamentals kind of things. Uh, I just had never taken it to a a live action stage where it's got to be a little bit over-exaggerated and dramatized. And I don't know if that's even a word, but we're going to make it a word for the sake of the podcast. Sure. Sure. And doing it in front of, you know, a uh, audience of a couple hundred people and getting their reactions and playing with the audience. And this is something that I had the benefit of my husband, who is an incredible stuntman. He's, you're, you're not going to see anybody better at high falls and fire burns. And I'm also very biased. And so 
he'd been doing it for doing it for a while. And so he had given me some coaching there. And then I had an incredible team that also was very patient with me. And a lot of it, we spent a couple of weeks prior to the show, kind of learning the moves and fundamentals and then doing it every single day, three, four, five times a day with your team. You just kind of find your groove. And I had certain things that I did with certain while I was fighting other stunt men. And then, you know, if they changed out and had a different character, then we did it a little bit differently or certain car hits would done a certain way. And it's just, it's a dance. It really is an art and a dance. And mm -hmm. the more you practice, the more comfortable you get. And no one can do it the way that you're going to do it because you bring your flavor. I'm six foot three. And so it was very unique because there was only like one other person on our team that matched me in height. And so, you know, it was, it was really interesting kind of being a part of a team learning what the acceptable amount of risk was, how to be supported, how to trust people that you're just meeting with your life, literally, and how to take things that you've already learned in life and apply them to a new skill in order to kind of build on that skill. So what kind of stuff did you do? I mean, and how dangerous was it? I mean, you're saying car hits. Were you actually hit by a car? I wasn't hit by a car, but my team members were. <laughs> oh, so wow. the way that we did it, like the first week, two weeks, is we all did every single stunt. And so we did car hits, we did high falls, we did fire burns, um, everybody did. What them. are those high falls? How high? And what's a fire burn? So this was a 42 foot high fall. Mm -hmm. Um so not quite the size of some trailers, but <laughs> nevertheless, wow. it was still pretty yeah. high. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you kind of imagine a big rig trailer on its side. That's kind of how high it was. <laughs> um, but then, you know, the fire burns are, you, you can do fire burn a variety of different ways. You have to have something between you and the fire, uh, whether that's gel on your skin or whether it's clothing that you're setting on fire. And then as long as you're moving, you can get away with a certain period of burning as long as you are in motion. When you stop moving is when you really do feel the flames and it gets very Ooh, uncomfortable very quick. Wow. So are you running um, into the flames? So it, normally somebody sets you on fire and then oh. you walk out. Oh my stage. goodness. <laughs> You yeah, have, it's I really thought healthy. I had guts. You got way more guts than oh, I do. Oh, man. <laughs> it's really healthy in your marriage when you're having a rough day to be able to walk outside and just set your husband on fire and walk <laughs> away. Um, <laughs> oh, my. Oh, feels gosh. really good. Um, but we also had a, a fire grate on set. So it was like a probably six foot wide by one or two feet. Um, well, one or two feet wide by six foot long fire grate that had propane tanks in it. And we had a motorcycle that would do a slide through the fire grate and the fire would come up and light the um, stunt man or woman that was on the bike on fire. And then they would walk around and be on fire and flail like you see in the movies. And so it's possible to do a fire burn where you don't have somebody lighting you on fire, but rather there's a prop on set that's going to light you on fire. Um, so <laughs> if you wanted to know the behind the scenes of stunts, like those mm -hmm. are kind of the two ways that you do it. And then for that, obviously he had a full suit on and, um, a hood, which it's, there's a fancy word. I think it's a baklava <laughs> is what it's called, or maybe oh. that's some kind of dessert or pastry. Yeah, that's I don't a, know. My husband will a, listen that's to That's a this. Greek dessert, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. balaclava. That's oh, okay. it. Balaclava. Okay. There we go. My husband will get a laugh out of that because I always get them confused. But then somebody <laughs> will be like, no, wait, that's a dessert. I'm like, okay, then it's a balaclava. <laughs> Sounds like baklava might be a little safer. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Yeah. And then um, you can high fall off of a building depends on how high it is some people do it onto cardboard boxes which is not comfortable and that's probably only good for like 15 feet maybe two to three stories um but we did it onto a like a mattress like a pad which is good for you know 40 to 50 feet and then there's stunt professionals that do it 100 feet and they do it onto an airbag um which an airbag is kind of like the creme de la creme in my personal opinion of, you know, high falling, cause it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily 
it's not as stiff, I guess, as a pad or as cardboard boxes, but you see it in the movies where most commonly somebody will come off of like a staircase or a window and they land on like a dumpster full of cardboard boxes. Mm -hmm. You just need something that's going to give away a little bit when you land. And, um, so my husband does a header high fall, which is probably one of the most dangerous, but he's just so incredible at it. And he'll do that on fire. So that's like kind of Oof. his specialty oh is like a, a fire <laughs> well. burn high fall. So somebody sets him on fire on the roof and he flails around and he does that for, you know, 30 seconds and then does a, a high fall. Um, and the pad that he high falls into has wet, like uh, kind of moving blankets on it. And so when he falls, they wrap around him and there's somebody there with a safety and a fire extinguisher just in case he doesn't get fully um put out but mm -hmm. he's he does this a lot more than i i've ever done it so he's done a variety of different shows so that's just some of the stuff he does ironically he's afraid of heights which oh is hilarious. wow <laughs> yeah. high falls are his thing um but he despises doing an aussie rappel like that's his least favorite stunt and that now, was what my is that? specialty it's a face first rappel and i did it from about 40 feet in high heels and a red evening gown and so oh now the red evening gown that would present a challenge too wouldn't it <laughs> i only got caught twice and i probably if you do this think about it i did it for a year six days a week and we had on average about four shows a day so however many times for those of you in the audience that are quick at math doing that and i only got caught twice so and both times i got myself down um, and only one time my high heel got stuck in the actual set of the wall that I was running down. And so I just, you know, finished the show and got back in my harness and went and retrieved my high heel and set it up for the next show. <laughs> <laughs> now these, these are live shows people come to see versus like in a movie. Yes. Mm, so if okay. you've ever been to like Universal Studios and seen like Waterworld or, I think they have an Indiana Jones stunt show. Um, those are the live action stunt shows that we did. My husband's done movies, um, but the only, like I've only done, you know, independent films <laughs> as far as that went. I knew I wasn't going to continue this career of being a stunt woman. I had other desires in my life, but I wouldn't have traded the experience for the world. And ironically, it taught me so much about life and business. And courage. I would think this would be a major confidence builder because if you can do that, you're not going to be anything else just kind of pales in comparison. It's like, eh, that's no big deal, right? I mean, fear, you overcome a lot of fear. Well, when you're diagnosed with a heart condition at 14, like you kind of start looking at life a little bit differently. Oh, is that what happened with you? I didn't know. Yeah. That. And wow. so it, when I'm presented with this opportunity, it's kind of like, if this door was not meant for me, it wouldn't have opened. I can choose to walk through it or not. It doesn't mean I have to walk through it, but what's scarier than death. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? I fall, I fall off of the building and die. Well, that's already been presented to me by a doctor saying you have a heart condition and you're going to die. It's like, that's, so that's no longer scary. And so stressing myself out or worrying about things that are a hypothesis, not to say I'm going to do stupid, dumb stuff on the regular, but it's like, I didn't go into it worrying about the worst case scenario. I prepared for it. And then I trusted my team and I set that aside because you can't go through life, convince the worst thing's going to happen because then mm -hmm. that mindset will impact your behavior. And then Absolutely. how you show up on set is not going to be conducive for a putting on a good show and b staying safe and so i just decided early on that i was going to set the worry aside and, and you prepare did, and you did this at 14. yeah because yeah you know i, I kind of looked at it and that's for anybody impressive. that's yeah. well for anybody that's been diagnosed with a you know a terminal illness or a chronic illness you know, there's kind of two paths. Like you can let that diagnosis dictate the rest of your life in the sense that you, you kind of feel like you have to stop living in order to just survive. Or you can say, okay, I, I know I've got a finite amount of time. Like, what do I want to do with it? And that's, that's the option that I took is like, I kind of took this permission slip from the doctor leaving that office that day and was like, now, what do you want to do with your life? Now that you, you know, understand 
what most 14 year olds or most high schoolers don't understand of the fact that you don't, I mean, nobody's promised tomorrow, but you, you just had this conversation where tomorrow is no longer guaranteed. Right. You've essentially got to fit 80 years of your life into however long this runway is going to be. So what is it? And if I hadn't, I think about that. And if I hadn't gotten the heart di diagnosis, then this random dude in my life being like, Hey, do you want to go to China with me? I would have been like, no, you know, that's something I can do later in my life. But I was riding mm -hmm. this wave of, you know, life and opportunities are happening for me. And so let me just say yes. And let me not worry about the logistics or how it's going to look on paper of, you know, this woman with a heart condition becoming a stunt woman. It's like, well, that doesn't logically make sense. And yet let's go for it and see what happens because what is the worst case scenario? I die. That's what right. most people in the stunt profession are worried about. Well, most of them that have been doing this for any amount of time are worried about being paralyzed, but it's like, okay, I could die. Well, that's already been discussed and talked about. And I've already come to that conclusion in my own life of death is a very, very real possibility that I live with every single day. And it's not that scary. You know, I, I'm going to die eventually. And at that point, I'm not going to care that I died. So I'm not going to waste my life worried about death. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at TruckingMovesAmerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. We're talking to Bonnie Young, the founder of Better Place Consulting. She helps businesses and people empower themselves. We've been discussing how she takes on fear and challenges learned by not only being a stunt woman, but also being diagnosed with a heart condition at the age of 14. Bunny has an amazing perspective of empowerment that she shares with everybody. She's truly courageous and takes on challenges most people are afraid to ever try. Bunny, you really are a powerhouse of inspiration with incredible wisdom, even when confronted with the thought of life and death. You were able to bring your inner courage to the forefront and really focus. Um, you actually, at a very young age, overcame a lot of the fears. I mean, when you think about it, adolescents are, are fearful. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy time. It's confusing. And I think people kind of bounce around and during their teenage years wondering who the heck they really are. You really made a concentrated effort to be focused, which gave you, I think, an advantage and a lot of inner strength. I have a really unique perspective on courage in the aspect that, you know, Shelly, you can look at me and say you were courageous, mm -hmm. but in that moment, it doesn't occur to me that it's courage because what other option do I have? Right. It's, it's living. And so courage can only be reflected by others. And it's only really something that you re you receive after the fact, kind of like a medal. Mm -hmm. But for those of, you know, whether it's in the military or whether it's in life, those of people that you're giving that feedback to, I would say almost 95% of them that I've had the co conversation with don't feel like there was any other option right. presented to them. Sure. And so it's, it is, I, I say that so that those of you that are listening that think I have to be courageous, you're already courageous to have made it this far in your life. You've already done things that other people have not stepped up to the plate and done. You've already lived through things that most people would run from in fear. And so I think that we all have that level of courage. And I think that at that moment in my life, if you had said like, well, make the courageous choice, I don't know that I would have known what to do or what that meant. But I just knew in that moment, what 
was going to make a positive difference in this world. And I didn't feel like lowering my vibration or living in anxiety or fear, especially for my family, was going to make the world better. And I think when you follow that, it's you're like, by default, making the courageous choice. I think you were very fortuitous at a very young age. I think a lot of people go through life. It takes them a while to do that, uh, to really realize what's going on. And the fact that you became, were you already athletic at the age of 14? Or was this something that you decided to do after this diagnosis? No, I was already athletic and I was an only child or I still am an only child. That didn't change. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had been modeling from a really young age because that was something that my grandmother and my aunt had done. And so that was a part of the family. And then I'd also already been working in my grandfather's company and my parents' company as well. And so as I reflect back now and look at my childhood versus other people's childhood um, that they might've had, I feel like I had a lot more maturity than most people. I mean, Mm -hmm. I started my first company at 17. Oh, wow. And I had, it was It wasn't really a choice. It was just kind of, I always preferred to hang out with adults because I just liked it. I liked being able to be a part of those conversations and I still love going to Disneyland. So my inner child is still very well taken care of, but I think at 14, I benefited. I I had lost my aunt, um, passed away from Crohn's disease when I was about eight or nine And I just saw what that kind of did for my family. And I felt like at that moment, I started making, I guess what I would call like big girl decisions in my life, where a lot of the innocence and essence of life was more clear to me, where I wasn't operating out of, um, oh, my parents will take care of it. Oh, you know, like that's something I'll worry about when I'm older. Like I wanted to take a little bit more responsibility and I became even more independent than I already was. And so I was very, always very curious about how everything worked from my grandfather's company to, you know, machines, to my parents' company, to, you know, the human body, especially when my aunt got sick. And so that's just kind of the way that I looked at life. And so I feel like I was 14 going on 40 in some aspects. Oh, yeah. And I can't say that a lot of teenagers necessarily do that. Uh, That's really amazing. And you're able to look at things and get the big picture, which I think that a lot of people are stuck in the minutia. And you obviously, um, as a consultant uh, with Better Place Consulting, you're able to see how you can help and that's where I wanted to ask better place consulting. How did that come about? What is that about? Because you help <laughs> businesses as well as employees, right? Yeah. It came about by wanting to help businesses understand how to take care of their employees. Mm-hmm. And we ended up doing that and we have an entire corporate division. And then I wanted to help people like my grandfather and like my parents that are family centric entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and they want to build a company that works for them rather than the other way around. And what I mean by that is that, you know, not to say that my parents didn't do an incredible job, but there were a lot of opportunities where my dad couldn't be there because he had to be running the company or had to be going and doing service calls. And um, I just wanted to be able to help family members scale and build something that they could sell or build something that didn't require them to be profitable. And I saw that and I just wanted to be able to help more people do that. And I ended up, it's not, it's not what I set out early on to do. I actually decided I wanted to be a therapist, but most of the clients that I saw early on in therapy, I was in social services. And I just felt like for every one kid that I helped 14 more appeared. And so I really didn't feel fulfilled and that that's completely on me. It's not to say the work that I was doing or that social services is doing is pointless because it really wasn't. But after several years of doing that, I just couldn't see the end in sight. I couldn't see how I was actually making the world better because it just felt like it was only one of me. And that's actually where the starfish and my logo came from 
is through transitioning to private practice and realizing that 80% of my private practice were unhappy with work and unhappy with their jobs. And they just were changing their jobs, but not really changing their mindset or their behavior or their beliefs, Mm -hmm. which is the psychological roots that everything grows from. I was like, you know, let me, let me try going into the companies and helping the companies. And so the starfish in a better place consulting's logo came from that starfish story of like, after a storm, there's thousands of starfish on the beach and there's a child picking the starfish up and throwing them back in the ocean. And this older man comes by and is like, there's thousands of starfish in one of you. You're never going to make a difference. And the child picks up a starfish, throws it in the ocean, says, I made a difference to that one. And that's why I started the company is like, if I can make a difference in one company, in one person's life, if one person listening to this podcast world is made a little bit better, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to take fulfillment in that because the, the issue that I had when I was working in social services was thinking that I had to solve the problem rather than help give people tools and help them solve the problem. Like I can't do it for the 84 kids that were on my caseload, but I can give the tools to the children and to the families that will hopefully change the next generation. And so now I decided to do that in business because as much as I absolutely love kids, I'm a third generation entrepreneur. And so I can't, I can't get that out of my blood. And that's really where, you know, I think that the best, um, like the best of me lies. And I I just remember like sitting there because I I didn't get a chance to tell you guys, my grandfather has a trucking company. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I just remember like, yeah, <laughs> sitting there. I I'd still, I want to be clear in my childhood years, I still did really dumb stuff like riding in the back of the trucks while they're uh, going around the yard in rolling chairs with my cousin, which was really dumb <laughs> and very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but, or, try, you know, I was like eight, nine years old learning how to drive a forklift by, you know, it was oh. not... <laughs> You, you, there's some things you can't reach on a forklift, even when you're a tall, like eight year old. (laughs) Yeah. (sighs) So some pallets might've been in danger that day, but I I remember sitting there in the yard, just like thinking, okay, so it was in Oxnard, California. And I'm like, they're surrounded by farm fields. Right. And so I'm thinking somebody plants a seed and grows a strawberry and like, follow me with this analogy, but like somebody in Oxnard, California plants a seed and grows a strawberry. And then somebody picks that strawberry and puts it in a box and that gets loaded onto a truck. And then that truck drives however many, you know, miles or states away, maybe even to an airport to have it put on a plane. And then that ends up like in a grocery store that somebody thousands of miles away ends up with this strawberry from a seed that was planted in Oxnard, California. And I'm like, this, this is fascinating to me to watch these trucks leave every single morning mm-hmm. and see the thousands of families that are going to be impacted sure. by them yeah. taking these products mm-hmm. yeah. or like they did, um, they did sets and scenes for like West side story. And they delivered them to all these different theaters all through Southern California. And we would go to these shows and most people are watching the stage and I'm turning around, like watching the audience being like, do you guys understand this was sitting in my grandfather's like warehouse three days ago? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Like, We're, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. I don't know how many kids would think this way, but I was just fascinated <laughs> to see how one person's energy or one person's dream and, and my grandfather's trucking company, you know, was something that he had started after he'd already gone bankrupt in the restaurant industry. And I joke that like, he decided to go into the trucking business, which he knew less about than the restaurant industry. And I don't know many entrepreneurs that would put money into the restaurant industry, let alone logistics and trucking. Mm -hmm. But my uncle ended up uh, loaning him the money for his first tractor. And, you know, that's, that's how the trucking company got started. Now my uncles are still operating it. My grandfather passed away in 2010, but it's like to, to see how one person's dream, like he's the Don Quixote of, trucking like beyond like he just likes that description (laughs) he he was not necessarily the business person that we would think of but he took really good care of his people and he trusted his people to take care of the process and the product and the profits and it worked it's still you know going today my uncles may slightly disagree because of course in trucking you have good times and bad times but 
Um, you know, I think about how many deposits, down payments on houses that trucking company ended up providing and the knowledge about business that it provided, not just to my mother, but also to me. Sure. And it's like from one person making that decision, use the word courageous, but from one person being like, this is, you know, this is the path in life, how that's just had a ripple effect or probably, you know, you started it in the seventies, millions of people. Yeah. And this, I think, kind of guided you in what you're doing. And, and I find it very interesting with Better Place Consulting. You help business define negative trends and you help people open their minds to possibilities, uncover their purpose, develop plans and goals. What exactly do you do? Are you working with the employees? Are you working with the management to turn things around and make things more productive and empowering? Yeah, so we work top down and bottom up. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's really, that's really the secret sauce is, you know, what's kind of the mission, vision, core values. That's where all of our work starts. Uh -huh. And then how do we think the best way to accomplish that is, and what are the biggest obstacles and what are the biggest opportunities and what are your unique gifts that you can bring and skill sets just because we've been doing something this way for however long does it mean we have to continue doing that? Right. And so part of it is a huge part of it is mindset and clearing out some psychological beliefs that are not necessarily serving us anymore. And that's, that could be, you know, burnout, that could be overwhelm, that could be, you know, a lack of productivity because we're doing too many things and we don't know how to ask for help or a belief mm -hmm. that we can't ask for help. Right. It could be a lack of clarity. And then from there coming up with an aligned action plan that everybody is bought into. And, and we don't come up with it as a consulting company. The company comes up with it. And then we provide, we move from consulting into coaching where we're coaching either groups or key individuals in the company. And that's, again, goes back to helping them use the tools rather than us do it in the company. Because if we, if we stepped in and we did it all, then when we left, it would all fall apart. So it's really important that we are supporting them in making these changes and supporting sure. them in building this better place within their company. And then from that, after they have some success, then we move into helping them maintain that in mm -hmm. their company and develop metrics that matter and really measuring what matters instead of just measuring the bottom line, which is a lag metric instead of a lead metric. And mm -hmm. so if you were just looking at, you know, your truck being on empty, it's like, well, that's, that's a lag metric. A lead mm -hmm. metric would be how many miles you can go with your load and planning all of that out, how much weight, all that. And so sure. those would all be like lead metrics. Right. And so then after that, we move into more of an advising role. And our goal is always to work ourselves out of a job a hundred percent of the time. Like if somebody, if a company says, we just want you to work with us for the next hundred years, that's not the kind of mindset of our ideal clients. They're motivated to make their company successful, not just for their clients, but for their team members. And they want to be able to sustain it internally. And they're motivated to be able to invest the re three resources that are necessary, which is time, energy, and money in mm -hmm. making that happen. And so when we move mm -hmm. into advisory role, it's kind of the most hands-off. They're riding the bike down the street, screaming because they've, you know, finally learned how to do it themselves. And right. we're just proud and on the curb clapping. This is terrific. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, is building a positive image of trucking by telling the story of the hardworking drivers and industry professionals who support the industry. And you can be a part of it. Learn more about TMAF and how you can join and be a part of the industry movement working to build a strong image of trucking by visiting TMAF's website at truckingmovesamerica.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our latest channel, TikTok. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. We're speaking with Bunny Young, the founder of Better Place Consulting. She started her first business at 17. 
She went on to become a stunt woman before she became a consultant, helping businesses and people empower themselves and achieve their full potential, along with a satisfying work-life balance. Bunny believes in making a difference with every person, which makes the world just a little bit better, thus a better place. Bunny, you inspire so many people from all walks of life. Now, we have listeners who uh, work in offices, too. Uh, it, it's a cross-section of uh, all careers, really, for women. What would you say are some of the biggest obstacles women face? I know you, you were saying burnout, uh, things like that. Women take on a ton, and certainly companies that don't necessarily accommodate, maybe, or empower can lead to the employee dissatisfaction. Do you have suggestions for uh, women on, on yes. some of this? Absolutely. Being a woman myself and being an army wife and having my husband deployed last year and learning like what it's like to do absolutely everything. Um, ah. <laughs> yeah. So my, I think the number one thing that I would say, and you're going to listen to this and laugh at me, but is asking for help. And what I mean by that is use something called the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 principle, which means that 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. And what I learned was that if I focus on my 20%, I actually am more productive and I can make more money and get more done. And then I have more time left over to be able to recover and restore. But mm -hmm. when I'm trying to do everything, even if it's something as simple as trying to do nine loads of laundry, you know, at the end of the day. And like my husband did this last night where he's like, oh, I've got one more load of laundry. And so I'm going to stay up 45 minutes in order to do it. I'm like, I'm going to do that load of laundry tomorrow and get the sleep tonight because mm -hmm. the sleep is more important than the laundry. Sure. Yeah. But we, we have this mindset of like one more thing and we've calibrated ourselves to create our to-do lists and look at your to-do list and ask, what can you automate, right? So if it's your Amazon deliveries or your grocery deliveries that you order the same thing probably every single week. So how can you automate that? How can you outsource something? So how can you ask somebody in your family or on your team, if you're in an office, to be able to collaborate with you so that you can outsource that? Or delegate it. So you're hiring somebody else to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening to this and you're like, but I don't have the money to do that. When you're focused on your 20%, you will make more money. It, it doesn't make sense listening to it. But when you do it, you just end up having more capacity and more capacity for what matters. You weren't here and designed to do it all. And just that mindset, if you just try this out for a week, just the mindset of, I can ask for help, I can automate, I can outsource, I can delegate. Hopefully you feel your shoulders relax and stop wearing them as earrings for a second. And, you know, for most of the clients that I work with, and this is from me too, the thought of taking the weight off my shoulders and handing it to somebody else seemed selfish. I was like, well, I don't want to burden anybody else with this. And so my coach had asked me, well, will you set it down? And I'm like, yeah, but it's almost like the struggle between I want to do it all because I want others to see me do it all. And I want the recognition for doing it all. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you the recognition for setting it down. Isn't it because also this a, is a, a loss of control? People don't necessarily want to. They're afraid that somebody else can't do it as well. That kind of thing, too. It's a set point. It's a psychological mm -hmm. set point to chaos and busyness. Okay. And so it's, it is not familiar. People mis people confuse this. They'll say, well, it's uncomfortable. It's not that it's uncomfortable. It's unfamiliar. And so when we can recalibrate to doing slightly less, even though it'll be unfamiliar for a second, you actually realize that you can accomplish more by doing less. And it doesn't sound intuitive. But because you have more energy towards the things that you're actually doing, you do them better mm -hmm. and you're more mm -hmm. creative with your solutions. And if the only thing that you're giving as an, a resource is your time, you're still missing out on energy and money. 
And so remember that you have all three of those resources. And most of the time we're spending all of our money on our kids or on things that aren't giving us back our time. True. And so if you can find a balance on, okay, I will spend the money to have somebody else do that. And then I'll have more time and it can be time for self-care. And I don't just mean like a manicure pedicure. I mean like meditation and working on lowering that set point or time to spend with your kids. Like I, the other day, my almost 12 year old, I just held her for a second. She was just having a meltdown. And I held her and just breathed with her and I didn't need to say anything. She just needed my energy. She didn't need my time. She didn't need me to throw money at the problem. She just needed my energy. I can't give that to her if my energy is set at a set point of chaos and busy. Yeah. Because then when she's having a meltdown and I hold her, I'm just going to be pouring that energy into her. So the, the best thing that I can do for her is take the best care of me. And this is true with every company that we work with, because they'll be like, well, I don't know what would happen if we, you know, created a 30 hour work week instead of a 40 hour work week. And it's like, well, that's just time. That's time. But if you gave people 10 hours a week of their energy back, like imagine the energy that they would be able to bring to 30 hours a week. And we've done this with probably eight corporations, massive corporations at this point mm -hmm. and tested out this 30 hour work week. And just the People are recovering from a mental health load, no matter what you were doing for the past three years. Yeah. People are true. recovering from a mental yeah. health load. Big time. And we, yeah. need, we need time to do that. So whether the past three years was because you went home and you didn't do anything, or you were one of the, you know, essential employees that had to work 10 times harder because mm -hmm. there was nobody else there. Right. And it's like, we, we have to have that time to recover. We can't just go back. That's not, that's not an option. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're headed from one, you know, epidemic into a mental health epidemic of burnout. And you're, you're hearing it being talked about to the point that people are tired, they're burnt out from hearing about burnout, but it's like, you've got to, at some point, understand that you, there's some short-term decisions for some long-term term positive consequences. Otherwise we're going to have short-term positive consequences for long-term negative consequences. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Kathy DeCaro is nothing short of amazing. She not only drives the world's biggest truck as a heavy equipment operator in northern Alberta, Canada. She's an international motivational speaker and the author of Dream Big, an autobiography about overcoming a lifetime of trauma and abuse that led to dreams of success. Kathy inspires people the world over to change their lives and improve their self-worth. Her book will change your life. She's passionate about personal growth and believes anyone can change their circumstances and overcome their obstacles if they believe in themselves. Her life will amaze you and seriously inspire you. Be sure to order a copy of her book, Dream Big, on Amazon.com. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at TruckingMovesAmerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. We're talking with Bunny Young. She's the founder of A Better Place. She gives tools to people and companies to make change for the better and open their minds to possibilities and identify and harness their unique skills by working smarter and more effectively. She teaches things like the Pareto Principle, which she says means 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. 
She helps people work smarter to overcome the obstacles like burnout, a lack of clarity, or motivation. You know, Bunny, people have been so stressed in recent years, and they seem to be feeling just plain overwhelmed. There's so much anger, divisiveness, edginess, uh, people, you can see it in their behavior. Certainly when you're driving, uh, there's a lot of aggression yeah. out there. Not that that wasn't a problem to begin with, but I think it's gotten worse. And would you say that is the burnout and the stress and people not dealing with it? And they're kind of getting themselves like they're chasing their tail and creating their own mental chaos. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it's just, it's the set point, right? You get yeah. in the car and you're already at like a 9.6. And then you I know, see it in the faces of people in the stores and on when you're taking walks and yeah. you can almost see the strain in, in their eyes and, you know, um, the tense in their shoulders. And uh, I think it's quite prevalent, quite honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and it doesn't challenges out there right now. It, it's so, it's so everywhere. And with the companies that we work with, no matter how much work we do within the companies, it starts with you. Mm -hmm. It starts with Absolutely. your willingness yep. and yeah. ability to set down that load. And so you had asked me, you know, for women, what we can do. And it's like, I want you to imagine <laughs> taking, because taking that load off and putting it down, because actually we operate 95% unconsciously and 5% mm -hmm. consciously. Our brain just cannot, you know, compute all of the input that we mm -hmm. have uh, every single second. And so- People are like, well, change my thoughts and change my life, oh. eh, kind of. But like your body actually stores all of that. Your cells yes. store that programming. And so like you were talking about, Kathy, with that like tension in your body, that tension mm -hmm. in your body is that psychological programming that turns into your behaviors, your beliefs, and your actions. And so if we can't get the tension to release... And by the way, when you, if you just like are listening to this and you hold your fist tight, as tight as you possibly can, and you look at the surface area of a fist of a closed tense muscle versus relaxing your hand and holding it open, look how much, much more resource you have with an open palm. And the same thing is true of your body. So when you let go of tension, you actually have capacity for more energy. You actually have more capacity to hold more. But so many of us think that that we have to hold on to the tension. Otherwise, like you were saying um, of, you know, losing that control. And it's like, well, that's fine. Go ahead. Hold on. As, if you're not willing to let go, hold on as tight as you possibly can, because your body's eventually going to release because we can only handle so much tension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, it's actually going into giving ourselves time and energy and space to go into the body and relax. And then our mindset will follow. And this, it, it sounds crunchy granola, but the same, this is the same stuff we do in corporations. And if we just attack mindset and consciousness, mm -hmm. it doesn't stick. People understand it, but it doesn't stick as much as if you can actually change your behaviors and shift sure. how you embody the next 10 years of your life. It, mm -hmm. You can choose this right now, the tension the overwork, the overwhelm and say, well, I'm only going to do it for X amount more years, or I'm going to find a new company, but you're bringing your body everywhere you go. Oh, that's very true. And mm -hmm. certainly people can understand the theory, like you were saying, but applying it is another thing. And you're providing really good information on how people can apply this to their lives and make a difference in their future, which is so important. Wow. There's so much we want to talk about here. I think bringing you back and maybe Focusing on some things and tips for women uh, would be really, really important. Uh, I, I agree. Love you. I love your insight, Bunny, because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're uh, amazing. Yeah. Ooh, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It sounds like you're making revolutionary changes in companies and helping employees and improving their lives as well as their productivity. I mean, that's a win-win from mm, my perspective. I hope so. I think. Oh, absolutely. Where do people reach out to you? The best place to get me um, is on Instagram at the Bonnie Young and the best place to get just more coaching and more of this discussion is on my pod podcast, which is the yes and podcast, which is kind of everything that we just talked about, you know, of not sacrificing either or, but being able to have both. Mm -hmm. And 
And the one thing to take away, you know, from this that I give everybody as homework is work on your breath because the breath is the one tool that we're born with. And we have all the way until we pass away from our bodies. And so your, your breath kind of is the greatest, um, underrated tool that, that you have throughout your day, whether you're sitting in a truck or you're sitting in an office chair. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What's your website again? Uh, bunnyyoung.com. And do you consult with individuals? Yes. So we okay. have a, a program um, that we do a six month coaching program to help people implement everything that we do in corporations, but do it on a personal level. So we, we have it. mindset and the life operating system and a business operating system. It's pretty beautiful. I'm proud of it. I think that everybody really can good. benefit from what you've got. This is terrific, Bunny. Thank you so it much. Is. Wow. I appreciate that feedback. And I appreciate you being on the show. And I'm serious. I think that having you back and maybe focusing on some things that uh, are pertinent. Gosh, there's so many things you could address right now with all of the crazy things going on in the world. But helping people cope. Yes. And thrive. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to just survive. You you can thrive. You know, there's there's a life beyond coping as well. This has been terrific, Bunny. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's my pleasure. It was such an honor to be with you guys. And vice versa, Bunny. You've helped a lot of ladies out there. We hope everybody's enjoyed this episode. And if you want to hear more episodes of Women Road Warriors or learn more about our show, be sure to check out womenroadwarriors.com. And please follow us on social media. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. If you want to be a guest on the show or have a topic or feedback, email us at sjohnson at womenroadwarriors.com. <laughs> <laughs>